There's another DJ who was there over at KUFO, Iris Harrison. I met her this about the same time I, I met you. And KGON. She's yeah, on KGON. KGON, I'm sorry. Yeah. And she retired last year after 43 years. She started the week before I was born. Yeah, and was I able know. to the continue legend. her career, sustain it for more than four decades. And again, that's all I ever wanted. Right. That's what everybody wants. But right. absolutely nothing on against her because she, you know, she worked her butt off to do all uh, that. Just, but I love Iris. What people don't understand is she, especially now, is the extreme outlier because oh, you lasted five years. I, broke in, busted my hump there. Like, you know, I, my marriage burned out while I worked mm -hmm. there. I had the onset of the mental illness that I still deal with while working mm -hmm. there because they had me working part-time, 20 hours a week, no benefits. And the most I was allowed to pull in every year was 11 grand. I mean, it's just unreal because they know how much you love it. So they know they don't have to pay you a lot for it. And, it's crazy. And, right. And every year, my PD would tell me, dude, I see what you're doing. You're busting your butt. You're a team player. You're this, you're that. Keep at it. Yeah. Your time will come. Yep. yep and at yep. the end of year four, the start of year five, and I know because you were there five years too, mm -hmm. our ends overlapped at the beginning of year five. He pulled me into his office and said, yeah, basically all that stuff I told you for the last four years, mm -hmm. forget it. If you want to get anywhere, you got to go somewhere else because there were opportunistic, ambitious people behind me mm -hmm. who knew how to play the politics of it. And again, these were privileged white male frat boys who didn't possess a tenth of the work ethic I had or the who, talent well and, and right? even then I never really considered myself Excuse the most me. talented person in the world but my whole mindset was I know what I need to do is I need to outwork everybody and build my talent up but then trying to find ways to get in and cultivate that talent just didn't happen. It took me a year to get to a point where I could get behind a microphone to be an update anchor. I never got a chance to even try out for an in-studio position. When they let me go, they did an American Idol. They really Oh did. my God. That's they so brought people in off oh. the street and oh. just did random deals to take the spot that I wanted, that I tried to get for three years. And so those people wrong. are still there. Oh my God. See, that's the wrong people are in charge of radio and you can, and you can, you know how, where we can pinpoint that. I don't say a lot of negative things about the Clintons because I don't think a lot of negative things about the Clintons, but the fact that Bill Clinton allowed the deregulation of the SEC in the mid nineties killed. That's what killed radio. It didn't kill radio right away. It was a long, slow death because when you deregulate and you allow a company to own multiple stations in the yeah. same city you and you dilute the audience in the way that they did and everybody started losing money and everybody's ratings went down it's like what did you think was going to happen you can't sustain four different stations that sound exactly alike in the same city you no. can't what and the thing that's so, and I said that, and I would say that to Mark repeatedly over and over. We would talk about when it was in the NRK days. And I said to him, how did it never occur to you before the, you flipped, before Marconi pulled that shit? How did it never occur to you that the reason your ratings never got up above a 2.3 is because you sounded exactly like KUFO? What were you offering that was different? Absolutely nothing. That how do you not how do you people never see this? Right. And then the other thing that you and I both know that for some reason people in charge of radio will never understand that is frustrating as fuck. Your audience does not like change. They do not. Why do they listen to you? It's not the music. They can get music anywhere. They don't need us. That's Especially what I told now. Them. Especially now. And, I, and that's a, another conversation I had with Mark early on, even before I had to renegotiate my contract and I saw it coming. As soon as people could get, the second they released an iPod, I was like, well, we're fucked. The second you could plug in your iPod into your car, when we learned that technology was available, I went to Mark and I said, we're in trouble. People are going to stop listening to the radio now that they can program their own music in their car. 
Yep. So we're fucked now. Yep. That's why you stream online. That's why you do this. That's and he couldn't see it. No. And I said, Mark, why do people listen to the radio? As the internet was growing, I said to him, they're not going to need us for traffic or weather or mute. We're not going to break music anymore. We're not breaking music. Music, music is breaking on MySpace. Right. We're getting music from the internet first. When I was the, I became, became, I was the first DJ in all of America to play the Foo Fighters cover of Band on the Run because I saw it posted on the Foo Fighters post board and somebody sent me an MP3. That's how we got it. I said to Mark, this is the future of music. We're going to get it from other sources. We're not going to break anything new anymore. That has been taken away from us because the internet is more powerful than terrestrial radio. And if we don't do something now, you're going to get lost in the sauce. And I said, the number one thing that you need to hold on to is the human beings who are talking on the radio because that's why people come back to you. That's why people come back to 94.7 instead of another station because they count on Greg and Tara and Gustav getting them through their day. I can't tell you, Devin, how many people would call me and say, I appreciate you so much. You sound so happy, like you're enjoying your job and you make my day better. And I could think of no bigger compliment than helping someone get through their day. People who wash dishes and drive trucks and did jobs that they didn't love would call me and say, I, you got me through my day. Right. And that's a huge responsibility that I took seriously. Even when I wasn't on the air, even when I wasn't hosting events, I was still an ambassador for the station. I was never drunk in public. I never behaved badly so that anyone could say, Tara from 94.7 did this. So what I told Mark when I saw all of this coming and I warned them and I warned them in the, in the meeting that we had to renegotiate my contract. I said, this is what I see coming. This is important to me that we hold on to our audience. And the way you hold on to your audience is that you give them a reason to come back. That's why newscasters are on the job for 20 something years because people develop a trust in those people. They don't want those people to leave. When the world goes crazy, they want a person that they rely on and trust to go back to. You don't take those people away. So when you do, and why they continue to change, 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 it does nothing except drive your audience away. So you change your format, you change your DJs, you change this. People are like, I don't know what you are anymore and I'm not coming back. Right. And, I, and the day they fired me, well, first of all, after I renegotiated, when I was renegotiating my contract and I said, I'm worth millions and I see this and I see that and I, people say this to me and people say that. They say, well, the industry standard raises 3%. I was like, great, I'll take it. Why are we having this conversation? I just want to go back to work and work here forever. So I want to work here forever. And they said, we know and we appreciate that. So two days later, Mark Hamilton came into the studio and he said, right, Tara, um, you didn't get the 3% raise we've heard back from corporate. I was like, I didn't get a 3% raise? What, I get 2%? He goes, no, you got a 16% raise. He said, I've Damn. never heard. He said, I have never heard of a 16% raise. That is how much of a tremendous asset you are. I cannot imagine this station without you. And I was gone two years later. So I was not a tremendous asset. I don't know. It was I? I know I wasn't the highest paid even after a 16% raise. I was not being paid with the two other men on either side of my show were being paid. I never made the most I made at that station in the mid 2000s. In two, so I was fired in May, late May of 2009. The last paycheck, I mean, the, my salary at that point was $39,000 a year. 39, 39. I was not costing them that much. And you can't tell me that it would have it made that much of a difference after they laid me off mm -hmm. because they kept Greg, they kept Gustav. They Nelson and Terry were still on the buzz and both of them were making six figures. And when I asked them about that, I was sitting in the office being fired. I was like, you're paying Nelson and Terry all. Well, that's a different budget for a different station. I said, take budget away from them and put it like you, you are killing the reason people listen. You remove the human factor. People will stop listening. Yeah. And I was right. And I was right, and I was right, and I was right. Hey guys, Devin here. Thanks for watching. Be sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you're new, and check out the links below for more great original content. Talk to you soon. Bye.